body shot. Ooh, that hurt, didn't it? When adrenaline starts pumping and you know what you can do with this right hand, it's hard to not do that. Here are your hosts, Derek G and AJ. One Jose Aldo might be sipping out of the same fountain of youth that we've seen the old timer Manny Pacquiao when he was really putting on that veteran status in the boxing days, man. We had some crazy events happen here at UFC Vegas 44. Lots of upsets, folks. As I'm counting it right now, it looks like we had probably about five, six, maybe eight upsets. I don't know, man. Maybe it's too much to count, but hey, let me bring in my, my co-host, the New Mexico native, the Santa Fe bomber himself, AJ, brother. What do you make of the fights that we just watched here this Saturday, my man? As for a bye week, right? We had a week off from the UFC. We come back. Maybe we brought a little bit of rust with us, brother. Rough night at the office. Let's talk about it. How you feeling? Real rough night at the office, Derek. But honestly, when this when this kind of fight night happens, man, I'm glad to see it. I'm glad when the upsets happen. It keeps yeah. us all on our toes, proves that anything can happen in this sort of fight game. And man, it was a very entertaining night, even though the picks didn't really line up how we expected them. Absolutely. I would tell you it's an entertaining weekend of fights, not just uh, here at the UFC, but look at Bellator. Sergio Pettis, man, pulled off one of the craziest upsets, maybe until seeing this Clay Gita fight this Saturday, but it was still a very crazy upset because of the stakes, man. He defeated Kyoji Horiguchi via a fourth round spitting back fist knockout, man. On the button, put the man to sleep, and this was a fight that Pettis was pretty definitively losing all three rounds he was down 10 uh nine to ten on the scorecards on all three judges scorecards so it's just like you know he got it he made it count and he proved that he is absolutely the real deal but then again there is you know you, i mean you lost the rounds you got the knockout it's still a little inconclusive but nonetheless that was some craziness right AJ, how impressed are you to see Jamal Sweet Dreams Hill notch a 48-second knockout victory over Jimmy the Brute Croup, my man? This is a fight where uh, we were really putting into question. I was specifically that dislocated left elbow that he suffered just six months ago. However, he didn't need to use that left hand at all, man. That right hand, that uh, that lead hand was money all day long. Right hook, right hook. Get him out of there. What do you think, brother? Bro, Jamal Hill flashed Crew twice. Mm -hmm. Crew did, you know, you know when he's hurt, when he's shooting those takedowns right away, just like he did in the Anthony Smith fight. Yeah. Very impressive from uh, from Jamal Hill. It was crazy to see, man. I didn't think. Uh, yeah, guess, I guess homeboy carries power in both hands. It doesn't even matter. Absolutely. Like I said, man, in the pre-show that the man could crack from orthodox, but I did see a little bit of atrophy in that left arm, man. So it's still something that I definitely want to hit on here in a second. And uh, AJ, I talked about it when the mics were called, man. But this is an episode where I am, you are, both of us respectively are going to have to eat some crow. And one man that I'm going to be shouting out here in a bit is the action man, Chris Curtis. He made me eat my words. He made just about all the detractors, the doubters, all the people calling him all types of stuff, man, saying he didn't have a chance to win. He proved everybody wrong, and he is someone that we need to highlight on this program. But in the meantime, folks, I said it was a rough night at the office. Uh, two and four, a pop for me and AJ, man. We tied on the week. Um, but so that didn't really help us, you know, no ups, no downs. It's not, it, I mean, listen, man, it is what it is. Short memory, we always say it. Let's move on to the next one because we got a banger coming up this upcoming week. But uh, in other news, my man. I just want to make sure, folks, that uh, if you didn't do it, we say it every time, watch the prelims. How many good fights were here on the prelims, AJ? Let's talk about it, my man, real quick. Manel Cop. we said he was maybe a sizzle in the pot. We said he needed to do something definitive, though, right? We said it. We were like, all right, if he can get the definitive win here, he's right back on track. Those two losses that he suffered in his UFC start don't mean as much. Let's really get into it here in a second. Not right now, AJ, but just give me a very quick take on that. Once was sizzle in a pot. Now is looking like hot fire flames right there, dog. What you think? Hot fire <laughs> flames, brother. I couldn't have put it any better. The star boy came to show up, and he really put it to Zuma Golov. Mm -hmm. As fast as he really could, man. The, he, um, Manel Cop looked amazing. I don't know. Yeah. I don't really. The, we'll, we'll save it for a little yeah. bit later. But amazing performance. That's a good headline right there. Manel Cop looked amazing. It is absolutely true. The man said, "I'm beautiful like a champion. No one's more beautiful than me. No one can fight or talk like me." Starboy is here to stay, my man. But uh, folks, drop a like, subscribe, all the good stuff. As we proceed into the show, we're about to get into a little bit of a ranking dispute right now. But uh, listen, man, we're on the upward trajectory. 325 followers and or not followers, subscribers, folks, on our YouTube. YouTube channel is not very far away we're about like almost 315 right now so please drop a like subscribe and uh, share it with your friends you know listen man we said every week you already know the gist by now right AJ you got any words for the people in terms of subscribing to the show 
Man, no, tell your friends, tell your homies, you know, just spread it out a little bit. I know that YouTube algorithm is working. Hit us with some likes. I've been telling everybody out here in Austin, always yeah. trying to get a little bit more, but I know the people that are watching that actually care, I'm gonna appreciate all of you, man. Wouldn't be here without it. There we go, AJ. So uh, like I said earlier, let's talk a little bit of rankings dispute, my man. Um, today, I think we have an interesting test on our hand. It's somebody that we were talking about here just one second ago, but Star Boy, 125 pounds. This flyweight division is a very interesting one, my man. And the reason why is because uh, oftentimes you have people where you don't necessarily know exactly who they are in terms of the, the the cusp, right? That 14, 15, 16, 17, right? You got some people who you're like, huh, I haven't really heard too much of the man. One person in particular who is number 14 in the UFC's consensus rankings is uh, Tagir Ulanbekov, right? If you're not a, uh, a hardcore fan, if you're not somebody who really watches the sport, you're probably not too, too familiar with the man. But he does occupy one of the spots right there on the cusp that could be occupied by some other people depending on who you are and how you view the sport. Now, my question here is with this very definitive first round knockout win against Zagas Zumagulov, we just said Manel Kopp needed to do something spectacular, definitive. He did it. He did that back to back. In the last fight, okay, we could we could take a step back, <clears throat> excuse me, against Ode Osborne because uh, the man missed weight, right? He wasn't professional. First time in his professional career missing weight, but he comes back, back to back KOs. AJ, I have Manel Kopp ranked number 14 in my rankings. You have him 15 in your rankings, and the UFC does not have him ranked at all. I've been saying from day one, I mean, you come in, you're fighting as a potential backup for a title for the flyweight division or whatnot. The man needs to be ranked. So let me ask you, with this win against Zalgis Zumagulov, who is not a ranked fighter himself, what type of push or bump or trajectory should Manel Kopp have with the outcome of this fight? Should he be in that 13 to 15 or do you think he's a top 10 fighter? I think at the moment he stays about 13 to 15, man. He's, he's right in that little, don't get me wrong, Zuma Gulov is an amazing fighter, but he's just not that same caliber sure. of that top 10 ranking. So we're, we're able to see that get it going. Now, next, next fight, let's say he fights somebody like Julian Paiva, Mateus Nicolau, you know, gets that one. I'm pretty sure they fought, gets that one back. It, uh, then we start to really see how that goes. He, um, when El Cop looked amazing with the pressure, the hands were crisp, even, you know, the takedowns, everything was going right from an El Cop. Just, I don't really see him at that top 10 level yet. I mean, he's there, don't get me wrong, but just facing that caliber opponent, I think it's a big difference of how he's able to show up on perform on game day. And if he's able to keep this win streak going, then I can see Tom 10, no problem. But right now, I still have him about that 13 to 15 level. What about you, Derek? Well, I have a question for you, my man, because I, I do think that, <clears throat> excuse me, for, uh, folks, for my voice cracking over here, but I, I do honestly believe that Manel Cobb has top 10 talent right now currently so let me ask you this brandon roy val right very fun fighter you know he's very uh very fast moving scrambles all that craziness does he win against Manel cop yeah i think roy val wins that one really okay interesting how about matt schnell dangerous matt schnell do you think that Manel cop uh would drop that one as well so though that Matt Schnell, Rogerio Bontarine, those are the two that I'm thinking that he has a little bit better chance against, just style wise. Mm -hmm. um, closer fight, I don't know. I, I that one, I, that one, I'm giving to Schnell just off of. Uh, mm. it, no, okay. no, it, it, yeah. <laughs> okay. How about uh, Tim Elliott? <sighs> Tim Elliott, man, he's uh, dangerous. He's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. I think I actually I think Manel Cop could get that one done. He's got the hand speed for it. Okay, so that's what's interesting, right? Is because I'm going to dispute a little bit. I don't necessarily think that uh, Matt Schnell. I think that uh, Manel Cop could get past Matt Schnell. I think he can get past Brandon Royval. Honestly, right now when he's on, Manel Cop is on, and. I don't want to make excuses for the man, but he said it himself. He says the first two fights that he had in the UFC, one of the biggest adjustments was he could not get his footing. Is that it was too slippery of a cage. He used to fight in the boots, right? We talked about it. People in the comments was like, oh, he's fought without shoes before. Da, da, da. He said it himself multiple times, and he said it again in the post-fight conference this weekend. He was like, yeah, man, that was pretty much the biggest of my woes because, like I said, man, he, now he's starching fools. You know what I'm saying? Now, obviously, it was a little bit of a drop-off in competition in comparison to his first two fights. But nonetheless... I think that Manel Kopp has top 10 aspirations and talent right now in the UFC. He says he's two fights away from a title fight. So let's just end right there, my man. You clearly think he should stay in that 13 to 15. He's going to stay within probably my 12 to 15 um, come Tuesday. But do you think that sentiment is true? Is he two fights away from a title? 
two fights i think he's close to a title i think he has a projection or the traction mm-hmm. for a title fight but two fights i don't know about that maybe if he does maybe you know he gets a Kai car france and starches him moves up next one to like a pantoja or something then you know he might be seeing a starboard for the title but that's a hell of a killer's path to get through first it is it is and absolutely and that's just the weird thing to me because i'm like if you're truly two fights away from a title shot which he came into the ufc as a rising champion this was the whole game plan is like you're going to be a top contender type stuff right if he's two fights away it's hard for me to believe that you know he is that 13th to 15th ranked fighter you know what i'm saying it makes me think that the ufc and others must believe he is higher than that so that is our 60 seconds rankings review this week folks let's see if the ufc will have manel cop crack their top 15 he's already in both of our respective top 15 so that's neither here nor there i've had Mel cop in there for a while so have you um the question is how big of a bump does he get so we'll see come tuesday check us out at bloody water podcast for our own personalized rankings you can find mine and aj just hit the rankings tab all that good stuff and then of course ufc will compare the consensus on the upcoming uh rankings review my man so move on to a little bit of recap brother i already talked about oh you see i already got the face plant right there let me let me take that away real fast man for those who are watching for those who are listening um this is what's important right now we're going to talk about just a little bit more recap on the on the prelims that we didn't necessarily hit already cheyenne blissmas aj let's talk about it real fast she got a win against uh mallory martin not just a win a fight of the night bonus 50k for both respective fighters i don't want to dispute because hey man get your money where you get it but i thought there was a couple other fights on here that deserved fight of the night over this nonetheless it was a very impressive performance on the feet for blissmas she wanted to make her name stick i think everybody can uh, understand and pronounce and say that name now no longer cheyenne bay is definitely blissmas made a name for herself how impressive was this win especially given she took the fight on 18 days notice after having a pretty bad bout of covid um so you know she was a little compromised in terms of her cardiovascular but her cardio was on point so what'd you think of this fight aj that's exactly what I was going <clears> to <throat> that's exactly what I was going to say Derek you know the cardio that was the biggest thing coming into question she proved it absolutely wrong she stayed busy hands were looking crisp stayed on the outside put it to Mallory Martin pretty decisively um fight of the night it kind of depends I mean it did go all 15 minutes and it was pretty back and forth for the most part but just Simon Bays was landing so much volume even had the power going forward pretty impressive performance for I just said Bays I'm my bad Vlismas <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, either way, very impressive performance for Vlismas going forward. And I think it, it was that mental hump getting over that fact of, of changing the name and then going in on off of COVID, having a short-term you know, uh, bout or short-term, everybody thought that her cardio wasn't going to hold up. I think this finally solidified her as that her own fighter. No longer attached. She's back with her old coach. I think this was a good thing for Vlismas going forward, and I really appreciate The fact that uh, I like that they gave it fight of the night, man. I think it needed that bump for the female division. I agree with you. There was probably some other fights that could have got it, but, you know, it's neither here nor there. Sure. I mean, I'm just talking about like the main event, Aldo Font, you know, maybe throw those guys a little 50K, you know, that was a banger after all. But nonetheless, this is her second bonus in her short UFC career, man, only three fights, two bonuses. So she's definitely a uh, she's making a name. I'm not going to lie, folks, when I put up when we put up uh, this this week for the you know fight week, um, uh, a little clip of like us talking about Cheyenne Blissmas that got big numbers in comparison to the other videos. So it's like she is a name. People are searching for her. And especially with this win and the way that she likes to talk a little bit uh you know what i mean during the fight i think she's gonna stick around for a while honestly but all respect to mallory martin that was a hard fought fight ultimately you know martin just wasn't the better woman that night but uh still a stud that's what makes the vlismas win even that much more impressive because martin is really really good but with that being said, um, let's talk about another one, man. William Knight, he edges out Alonzo Menafield, man. This is one that not too many people saw coming. A unanimous decision win over Menafield for William Knight. I also didn't expect William Knight to initiate grappling early on in the fight. I thought Menafield, he has the wrestling edge. He's the one that's going to be able to do it. At the end of the day, this was a controversial um, decision, I guess we can say, because a lot of people thought Menafield, even though he kind of rested on his laurels in the third round, he should have got the nod. But that's the point, AJ. We say it week in, week out. You cannot rest on your laurels. And William Knight says a fight is about being aggressive, bringing the fight to somebody, and that's what I did, and that's why I won. Do you agree with William Knight there? 
Yeah, yeah. For the most part, that's that's how I feel like the judging should be scored. You know, if, if yeah. you're the attacker, you're the aggressor, you're maintaining that pressure, you know, you should be able to get the get the nod. But if some guy's just laying on you, even whether you're on the ground or on the cage, either way, they're just putting your body against yeah. you. That's why I still disagree with the TJ Dillashaw win over Sanhagen. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily how I would score the fight, but to that point, we were talking about it, Derek, to that point you as a fighter should be able to get that guy off of you if you are that stud of, of aggression and being able to do that. And you should be able to flip the script and, and, and get that off of you. So it's kind of a knock on William Knight as well that uh, Alonzo uh, Menafield was able just to hold him basically against the fence and rest there. Uh, but at that same point, these two dudes had that gas tank going, man. <laughs> that gas tank was empty, so I could see why they couldn't because those are two big big hosses in there, man, trying to, trying to just – live basically because they yeah. that first round i did not expect this to go any further than the second because i thought one of them was going to gas out and they, the other one's going to get the finish whichever way it went it became a war of attrition that's what happens with the big boys you know what i'm saying i thought under one and a half was a lock i thought that was easy money and it almost was man both of these dudes had each other hurt um but william knight i think he hurt menafield a little bit more in this fight ultimately it's a, it's a big win for william knight he was a plus 150 underdog man so that was uh we started off the card with three straight upsets man which is pretty impressive now the next one claudio poyas he got a big knee bar win third round knee bar win his second of his career in the third round he actually has three total one in the ultimate fighter as well of knee bar finishes um but he got it done on chris grutzmacher and i'll tell you what man this was a uh, a fight that was interesting because i was a little surprised about grutzmacher's game plan didn't really make sense to me he tried to engage and grapple with puyas even though grutzmacher is the gritty boxer that's going to stand up and walk you down and all that kind of walked into a couple takedowns himself right there um this was a big win for puyas man um he got a little bit of criticism based on his grappling but he was getting the job done time in and time out so he's one of those dudes that people just keep doubting him myself included and he keeps Keeps winning my man is the future bright for pool yes what do you think i think so i i mean they're gonna they're gonna pair him up with somebody who's a little bit more more skilled on the ground not to say grits isn't as skilled it just it was a very you could tell poyas felt comfortable anytime in there he didn't see any real distinctive disadvantage that grits was bringing forward so i think next up for puyas they're gonna give him somebody a little bit more skilled on the ground at least to to get him out of his comfort zone yeah. the hands were looking crisp for chris grutzmacher but the second they went down to the ground you could tell puyas was just in his element feeling nice that knee bar was dirty yeah, good fight for chris or for puyas but uh yeah i think the future we'll see about title aspirations but he's definitely going to be fighting up pretty big on this next jump well, he's fighting in that stacked 155 pound division, man. So, you know, we're going to see a lot of contenders over there, a lot of prospects, a lot of killers just in general, my man. Um, listen, Louis Smolka, this was a man we were highly touting coming into fight week. Everybody was, and Vince Morales shocked the world on this one, my man. He got a nasty, nasty right hook KO, man. He flatlined the man, and that is alluding to that photo that I had in the beginning uh, when I first popped it up, my man. But he face planted Smolka. It wasn't really a fight, but, but Vince Morales had a very impressive showing. Um, now, I don't want to take anything away from morale this is a huge win he was a plus 120 underdog he got that plus money underdog money man shout out to you my question is for lewis smoker man is this something that you just put in the back seat and you just keep it pushing or what i mean what do you make of this one if you're him this is a terrible result for a man who hasn't been very active recently yeah, this is a terrible result, especially for somebody who was kind of on that same path. Like they, he was, they were building up Smolka pretty good. It's just the inconsistencies and the inactivity was really a detriment to him. And yeah. man, uh, for Smolka, I think best thing, you know, get back in there again as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. Just quick memory, forget about it, and keep it rolling. Basically, yeah. take this in your mind as you just got an unlucky catch one day, and that's just how it goes. You're gonna get yeah. the next one back. Yeah, anybody Rough. can get caught, man. Anybody can uh, can get caught. So I just say, um, get back in there and right that wrong. You know, simple as that, my man. Maki Patolo, he drops one against Dusko Todorovic, man. This is a big one for Dusko. This is a big, big one for for uh, Thunder, my man. That's his nickname. And uh, he actually revealed in the post-fight interview that he got hit by a car recently in, like, the camp coming up to this fight. So he's a, he was on a gimpy leg. And it kind of makes sense when you think about the game plan. Normally, you see Dusko decide he wants to stay back. He 
He wants to use the jab, use that right right cross, be long, lanky, use his reach, right? He did that a little bit, but then he said, yeah, now we're taking this fight to the ground. Almost got guillotined, got out of it, and then finished Patolo on the ground, completely smashed him. Um, it wasn't close. This one did cover the uh, under two and a half rounds, I do believe. Yeah, this was a first round knockout, actually. So this was under two and a half rounds. Like I said, this is a huge win for Todorovic, who is now two and two in the UFC. Lost two in a row, you know, lost two. Got two back. All right, we back at 500, basically. Just like coaches say at halftime, the score is 0-0. Now let's get to it. What do you make of Todorovic now? Um, with this big win, he showed he's a little more versatile than I think we thought. A little more versatile, and I think this was the smartest win for Dusko. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows. that You hear that name, Todorovic, everybody thinks chin in the sky. Even on the commentary, that's all they were saying. Like, <laughs> the biggest problem, he likes to fight with his chin up in the air. Literally, everybody sees it. And the way Dusko was able to switch it up and not even allow that to be coming, he mm -hmm. just he said, fuck it, we're going to the ground. Yeah. Did get hurt a little bit. Makitolo, interesting, always interesting whenever you're you're pulling guard in the UFC. It makes sense in, you know, jiu-jitsu, but pulling guard in UFC, it's just a bad look. He, he had a pretty deep lock in on that guillotine choke, but uh, Dusko knew exactly what to do, put those hips high, get that pressure off the neck, mm -hmm. and went to work after that. Very smart win for Dusko. That's why I like this one for him. He was able to not let his faults or not let his weaknesses be shown and, and work for only his strengths. And that's exactly what you want to do in the fight game. Absolutely. And what's interesting is he actually said that his leg had given out on him in the warmups leading up to the fight. So he got pissed and then just fought off of rage or something, which is never a good idea. But I guess it worked out for him this time around. Clearly, these guys are professionals, man. So when they say that, you know, there's a little more to it. But um, he, listen, a motivated Dusko Todorovic is a very, very dangerous man. Uh, listen, man, we're, there's only one guy left that we need to talk about on these prelims. And it's because I think... Even though Brian Barbarena, he got a big win. I think that uh, Darian Weeks, he's one of the biggest winners on the prelims because he went three hard rounds with Barbarena. And this is a dude who just basically came off the couch, more or less, right? This was supposed to be a contender series dude, obviously. He was game, ready for the moment. But I'm just saying this was that short notice, just get two bodies in there and let's scrap. He had a very valiant effort, my man. What do you make of Darian Weeks being able to hang in there with Barbarena for those three rounds? Bro, it says levels. Like, it mm -hmm. says that Darian Weeks is ready for the game, man. Because you're in there with Bam Bam Barbarena. Yeah. A lot of people get dropped pretty quick, especially coming, like you said, basically straight off the couch. And I know Darian Weeks. He's yeah. he's in the gym. He's getting it done. You know he's staying active. He's still young in the game, young enough to where he's not worried about, you know, camp so much as he's just in there training consistently. And you can tell, bro, he's been putting in that work. If you're able to stay in there with Brian Barbarena, there's a lot of people who have it, man. Randy Brown gets it's a loss or uh, excuse me um Randy Brown beat him, uh, but he did about uh, uh, Barbarina beat Jake Allenberger, Warley Alves, Sage Northcutt, all the pretty high level names going forward. And the fact that Darian Winks was able to get it done speaks levels to the fact that this dude is just staying prepped, staying ready. Very impressive. Even though he didn't pick up the dub, he did pick up that UFC contract. And that's almost a little more important at this stage in his game, man. What do you think? Well, I'd absolutely agree with you because oftentimes you'll see people who are like, I'll step in on short notice and I'll take this fight just to get the UFC contract and then just get starched immediately, you know. For him to go valiantly, three hard rounds with Bam Bam Barbarena gets a lot of stock on his name. And now I think the next person they're going to match him up with is going to be like, ooh, okay, this is going to be a tougher test than I thought, man. Like, this dude is game. He's ready. Cardio, in shape, six-pack, the whole nine, man. Six-pack don't really mean anything in terms of a fight, but I'm just saying the chiseled, you know, he's ready to go, ready to rock. Put some respect on the man's name. All right, so that's the prelims, folks. If you didn't watch it, I mean, I don't know what's wrong with you at this point. We could hammer it away, hammer it away, hammer it away. You saw it. We got the fight of the night on the prelims, and it was the only ladies' bout of the entire card. So we let you know in advance this was going to happen. You're welcome. Check us out, folks. Bloody Water Podcast on Instagram. Bloody Water Pod on Twitter. Bloodywaterpodcast.com. You dig. All right, AJ, now let's hit through this photo collection real fast. Um, like we said earlier, this is just a face plant right here, man. This is perfect right hook on the button. You never want to be face down, ass up. But this is, unfortunately, the reality for Lewis Smoka here on UFC Vegas 44. Just give me a quick take on the photo. Yeah, worst worst place to ever be. Like you said, Derek, you never want to be face down, ass up, hands tucked under your belly, not able to defend yourself. Bad look for uh, Smoka, but great look for um, yeah, Vince, uh, Morales. Vince Morales, man. Yeah. Yeah, man, and I will just say, you know you actually put somebody like Flash KO'd on something like that when their hands don't even react to catch their fall. You literally catch it with your face. Like, that that's how you know. Face plant, literally. Um, this was just a beautiful knee bar, man, like I said. 
I think that Groot's mocker should be a little fortunate that Poyas didn't actually crank crank the way that maybe Pollyanna Viana did um, when she fought. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name, but you know who I'm talking about. She's you know. When she dread is her nickname, but yeah, she got that crazy knee bar crank, really pulled, and she was screaming in agony. Groot's marker ain't gonna be out for a long time because this was a mercy one right here. Uh, what do you think of that one, AJ? Ooh, like I said before, interesting choice for Grits to go to the ground with Puyas, but yeah, like you said, man, it, not the fact that Puyas didn't just start cranking on that. Yeah, it's uh, it shows a little class on his part because that are that knee is extended. You could even see a little bit of that that bone kind of starting to pop through that backside, that posterior side of Gritzmacher's leg. Yeah, man, this one just looks like it hurts. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man. And this next one right here, this is just a funny photo right here of Lismus. I think that that this is a. Uh, uh, a good just like metaphor kind of for her fight style man she just like does and what's funny you know about this aj is that mallory martin was doing this the whole time to vlismas which is why she did it back kind of like i'm tagging you up why do you keep doing that to me because martin was walking through shots and being like mm, like that was nothing or whatever yeah man listen i told you earlier fan favorite in terms of her her talking the way that she likes to go about it in the cage she's known for the bitch i'll follow you home to the get the fuck up when she had hillary rose on the mat to the now you know let's fucking go let's Fight, man like you gotta love it i love that uh she says she says it in the cage so uh, espn doesn't have enough time to like you know uh blank it out how do you call it censor it out you know how they try to do it so it's funny on that side but what do you think of the photo aj yeah I, I, that's probably one of my favorite things about listeners going forward man she's about that action and she's down bro she's down to talk some shit she even yeah. uh, on in the cage this time she's wrestling she's like Bro, get off me. Let's fucking fight. Like, yeah. what What are you doing? Come on. Yeah, I think that uh, that might have been there right there what earned her that 50K bonus for that yeah. or for that fight of the night, just talking the shit in there, making it exciting. So we don't see a lot of that. We see a lot in the men's divisions, but not a lot in the women's divisions. Even uh, when Mallory Martin was going back to her corner, I think it was in the second, first or second round, the coach was like, what'd she say? Like, what? <laughs> Everybody, everybody's interested, even the other coaches, man. Exactly. Great photo for Exactly, man. And then uh, AJ, man, I just put this up there simply for the fact of, uh, listen, man, that is a scary, scary man to stand in front of, right? This is a photo, for those who are listening, of William Knight just flexing, man, roaring, the beast on there, man, arms popping. There are a few men in the UFC, probably in the world alone, that could kind of make Alonzo Menafield look a little small. When I was looking at them, like, you know, when they're in the cage, I was like, how is it possible that William Knight's biceps are larger than Alonzo Menafield's? Like, how is that even possible? But it is, my man. One question, and I don't want to disparage the man because he is a he is a savage of a fighter. A lot of people are saying, uh, USADA, huh? Is this man getting tested? What are you thinking? That's a lot of muscle mass on that man. What do you think? It's a lot of muscle mass. I mean, he's always been a big dude, though. I'd be interesting to see where he, you know, the progression of how mm -hmm. he's going about it. Because, uh, I mean, with when you're this jacked and you're able, like, the cardio wasn't was, wasn't there as best to say. I was gonna say that if if it was, then I'd really be pushing yeah. that you saw the button. You know, <laughs> if he was able to stay this jacked and stay with the cardio going. Oh yeah, this this man needs to get tested a little in in depth. Yeah, man. I'll just say j j j j jack man my lord that guy got some muscles on him um aj this is the start of a little bit of ugliness right here it took approximately four significant strikes for jimmy crude's face to look like this broken orbital probably what do you think of the photo Woo, man you know that's what they'll probably about two to three maybe four punches yeah, yeah that's uh that's some power that that heel has and yeah rough look for jimmy crude man two two rough real rough losses for him back to back that's uh this is one of the ones that you hang up never want to see again Absolutely. And he took his loss like an absolute man. I'll say that. He just said, hey, Hill, love you, bro. All good. All respect. It is what it is. I'm going to get back up and I'm going to go handle business. And that's what I intend. And uh, well, that's what I expect Jimmy Cruton intends to do. Excuse me. Um, and I will just say real quick, man, I think Mullets went 0-2 on UFC Vegas 44. Just an interesting stat I'm going to put out there, folks, in case you, uh, you know, any fighters listening, deciding on their hair choices and whatnot. Um, another kind of ugly cut right here, man. Riddell had a nasty cut opened up on his eyebrow. And what was interesting to me on this one, AJ, is this bout was actually in general of being stopped due to cuts before Fazeev got the wheel kick KO. So uh, just give me your take on this nasty cut, man. Do you think that if uh, Fazeev would have targeted that a little bit more in the third round that it truly could have got stopped? Uh, it 
I mean, we saw the the ref go in there and say, you know, like it gets any more damage, we got to call the fight. Yeah. But it's in a, it's in an interesting place because it's above the eyebrow, so it's able to roll off a little bit to the side. And we yeah. saw that exact thing start happening when it happened, or when he actually got the cut, because yeah. it was just rolling off the side, not necessarily in the eye. So if it was below the eyebrow, then I'd see a little bit more cause. But I think they were just playing it safe, to be honest with this. I I, I don't think they would have would have called it. Maybe if it started open up, you know, two three inches, getting big, but. Yeah. A good, good gash. And what was nice is he got one back on Fazib as well, man. Cut up the boy as well. Absolutely. I just wonder what, what the procedure is going to be like to close it up. Stitches, you know, or is it plastic surgery? I don't know. It's a pretty deep one. Uh, pretty deep one. But uh, all right, AJ, last thing I got in here is this is just a call out, man. So Edmund Shabazian, he says, you know, a bunch of laughing emojis on Twitter, right? He says, bitch ass, shut the fuck up, talk that shit and get laid out. And then he adds Brendan Allen after Brendan Allen got stopped by Chris Curtis. Now, Brendan Allen replies, says, it's all good. I'll see you in March or April. Take your pick on the month, man. We're both irrelevant now. So I'll see you then. First off, the humility of Brendan Allen is second to none right there, man. You got to be a little self-aware. And I think he absolutely was right there. Not not irrelevant by any stretch of the imagination but it's funny basically because it's that ideology of um when you win you know you keep moving forward doing that you lose you're irrelevant you're out of the picture and uh, coming off of that loss i think he understands that even though the man is only five and two in his ufc uh, tenure man very very good overall what do you think about this little uh, exchange here aj I think it's a, a smart move from both of them. Very self-aware from Brandon Allen. I like the way you phrased that, man. He, uh, he know, he knows what's up. And what's nice about it too, he says, uh, you know, Shabazz, you're talking shit, man. You're just as irrelevant. Nobody knows who you're talking about, man. Don't, don't come in here trying to act high and mighty. I like that subtle shade from Brandon Allen. And these two fight, these two square up. It's gonna be a good match. Absolutely. And both of them coming off a loss now. So, you know, the fight can actually happen. It can actually happen. All right, folks, that is our photo collection. So if you like the segment, drop a like, subscribe, share this with your friends, share this with all of your fight friends, all the fight companions, fight homies that you got, anybody who's interested, man. I was at work and, you know, you got some of these casual folks coming in here talking about the fights. We chopping it up, doing all that good stuff, man. Just throw a little recommendation out there. Oh, man, you listen to the Bloody Water podcast? Yeah, best show on the world, man. Best show in Las Vegas, in the world, in Austin, Texas, across the globe internationally whatever the case may be hey we've actually been getting a lot of love on the youtube channel from indonesia recently so shout out to all the indonesians man we appreciate you we rock with you all that good stuff all right aj now let's get into it man alex the great white morono gets a ud win over mickey gall and uh, this is interesting you took gall in this one which was uh, a very interesting move but alex morono he got the dub the fight didn't really hit the mat we didn't see a lot of jujitsu which is probably the catalyst behind morono's win but morono did mention himself that he was surprised that Gall chose to stand as much as he did. And I think that this was a trend tonight where a lot of people were kind of deviating from the expected game plan. And nobody really knows the game plan. We're all assuming and just kind of guessing here. Uh, but were you surprised to see Mickey Gall just try to box up Alex Morono? Yeah, man. I was expecting Gall to shoot a lot, a lot more. <laughs> I was expecting him to go for ground game. I, I felt he had the advantage on the ground where Morono had the advantage in the hands. And that's what it played out to be. It, it might have been that Morono was able to shut down the ground game and able to keep things standing. So credit to him for that one. But yeah, I was surprised to not even see. I think Gall might have attempted two three takedowns yeah. maybe but if then probably not yeah i think it was two the first one was decent the second one you saw alex morono sprawl like his life depended on it and that's part of the game plan right maybe part of why golf said okay well i guess that you know this isn't going to work we're just going to put the pressure on him and he put the pressure on him but alex morono he's an educated fighter man even though he has this wild brawling style and he tends to put himself into these firefights the man is is as dangerous as they come he talked about his jab all in the post fight presser and i believe that he does have a very very solid jab big hooks that were swinging and missing that left him open to get countered um but you know under the tutelage of safe Saud, i honestly believe that uh alex morono is in good hands man he's just kind of putting away anybody that they put in front of him for the most part and with this win right here it marks uh, him being 10-4 and one no contest in the ufc third win in a row so the question here aj is uh do you think that Alex Morona with this win over Mickey Gall, who is a name in and of himself, even though, he, like I said, we said earlier, not the biggest name. Where does he put himself? He, he's effectively ranked kind of around 31 on topology at least, but over there for the uh, for the welterweights right now. Where do you see him going next? We'll talk. We'll talk matchmaking, of course, but just give me like in a sentence. Do you see him kind of facing that top fifteen to like twenty, twenty-two ish range or soon, or are they going to keep stacking him up in that mid twenties? 
the the way I'm the way I'm thinking about this one is Alex Morona has really solidified himself as someone who's a, like a, a true gangster in the division. You know, oh, yeah. somebody who's willing to fight, willing to fight names going forward, and I think that's who they're going to give him next. Really, that. 15 to 20 range, but I think they're going to give him somebody of a little bit more name recognition. So that way he's Marona is able to make a little bit of a name for himself going yeah. forward. He did a little bit with Mickey Gall in this fight, but again, Mickey Gall is a smaller known name. I think the next one's going forward is going to be a little bit bigger, but still in that 15 to 20 uh, ranking ish. Yeah, sure. And uh, Alex Moreno, he cashed in as a minus 220 favorite, got the dub on that. And for folks who are interested, the over cashed on this one as well at minus 200. Um, just to give the heads up, because um, we can move on from this bout onto the next one. Just to give the heads up on this one, uh, both of us, we went three and three a pop on the over and unders, right? So, like I said, it was just kind of a, kind of a rough night overall. But then there's some unexpected things that I don't, I mean, even the odds makers, they didn't expect it. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, move on to the next one. Okay. I got to eat some crow right here, AJ, so just give me a second. Let me single myself out. Chris Curtis, the action man, you have proved me wrong. You have made me eat my words. This is the second time in a row that you pulled off an incredible knockout victory, um, but this one right here spoke volumes. Not only was everybody saying, oh, Brandon Allen is the real deal, Chris Curtis is in over his head, including ourselves here on this program. We said he was a little in over his head with this matchup because of the well-rounded nature of Brandon Allen. Not only can he strike, he can grapple, he can choke you out, all the good stuff, right? But Chris Curtis, I got to give him more props on top of that because he did something that was probably the smartest thing you could do. And he made Brandon Allen fight Chris Curtis's fight. That was the key right there, I think, and the catalyst to the victory because Brandon Allen, he was on the feet way more than I thought. Yeah, he got a nice shot in early on in the fight, right? Early on in the first round, Brandon Allen got a shot, got the back, and we had a submission attempt kind of working, you know. He kind of jeopardized and gave everything up right there when he decided for whatever reason to drop to a to a, a heel hook, you know what I'm saying? Which is a you talked about pulling guard is a dangerous thing to do, but pulling for heel hooks is an even more dangerous thing thing to do in mixed martial arts, man, because you just get punched right in the face. Now, I don't remember if that was in the beginning of the second round or if that happened in that first takedown attempt in the first round, but either way, the submission defense, the takedown defense, the ability to get back to his feet and get the fight back to where he needed it um, was very impressive by Chris Curtis, man. So I have no doubts. The man has won me over officially. Yes, am I late on the bandwagon? Absolutely, but better late than never. Brandon Allen was the test, AJ. I personally believe that not just a Chris Curtis, for anybody, if you pass that test, just like Sean Strickland, you pass that test, all right, bro, you're legit. I mean, what else can we say here, my man? Brandon Allen looked like a dude who was fighting emotionally. He looked like a dude who was a little phased by Sean Strickland screaming out in the corner, Chris Curtis, you're here for violence. You're not here to play games. You know, all that. Like, I loved all of that. I loved the environment. And when we're talking about striking, I honestly believe that Chris Curtis has some of the best striking right now like levels above levels above in the middleweight division now he's been that tweener welterweight middleweight type cat man but he's got some of the best striking to do it right now man the counters everything dig into the body going to the head beautiful so i have all that being said aj i know that we were both were very adamant that allen was going to win on this one but chris curtis he got the job done and uh, you can't doubt the man anymore 2-0 and in his ufc tenure man dude's got like what 16 knockouts in his career now impressive stuff hats off to you chris curtis now, AJ, with that being said, now that all of that is aside, do you have any words, any any repenting that needs to take place here for Chris Curtis? What do you think? Ooh, I, I agree with you, Derek, the most. You said it the best, man. I had to eat a little bit of crow. And, and actually, it's a pretty big portion of crow over here because Chris Curtis absolutely proved us wrong, man. He looked good, ch chirping from the beginning, staying busy. He was there for violence. Looking like Brandon Allen kind of a little bit shocked when he felt that power. The second he uh, Chris Curtis started landing, you really saw Brandon Allen's eyes kind of open up wide a little bit. And what I like most about Chris Curtis, man, that is a very crisp jab. He has power, but those short counter shots in the transition, that's where he's most dangerous. He needs to get that war going to set up things to where you don't see those little short, short hooks coming across. They might not be the most powerful, but he knows how to land on the button. And that's what I like most about Chris Curtis is how precise he is in those exchanges. He's able to get it done. This dude's a real deal, like you said, uh, Derek. Brendan Allen is like that that quintessential test of, all right, are you here for real or are you just a flash in the pot? Chris Curtis is the real deal going forward, man. It's I like when we have to eat a little bit of crow because it proves us wrong, man. It proves that we're still there's still things to be seen and the new dudes can come in and get it done. And it's not always the A side that's going to be winning. Chris Curtis came back and proved us wrong, man. Great show. Great performance. Hella good. 
it's, I'm excited to see where they put him next going forward in the future, man. Absolutely, man. And if you look at it, I mean, I, I don't know if this is two 50K bonuses in a row, but this was a performance of the night absolutely right here. Completely deserved it. Um, but I just wanted to talk now that we've given the praises to Chris Curtis just a little bit about Brandon Allen. This was still a good performance by him. You know what I mean? It wasn't a bad performance. I'll just say he played Chris Curtis's game just a little bit too much, man. How surprised were you that he kind of, even though he tried a couple takedown attempts a little bit, you know, more as the fight progressed, like maybe two or three overall in the fight, were you surprised that he didn't just try to force the fight to the ground, that he didn't just say, like, with everything in my might, I'm getting this fight to the ground? Because he just stood on the back foot and just tried to trade back and forth with Curtis, man. It wasn't really the greatest game plan. What do you think? Well, and Curtis even said that Brandon Allen isn't the best off of his back foot. So it was very surprising to not see Brandon Allen try to go for a little bit more takedowns or, or do anything in his power to get it to the ground. Interesting outcome, and we saw it not work the best for him because yeah. Curtis just had the power in the hands, man. And I'm wondering if maybe Allen felt something from Curtis that discouraged him from shooting, same way for the Morono, Mickey Gall type situation, right? Maybe he hit him with something that he was like, if I shoot, man – he's got something coming for me like you never know in that type of situation so i think overall um this was a really really good bout in terms of like moving on upwards towards the in the middleweight division you know what i mean on tapology brendan allen is ranked in like number 12 or something man they got they really think highly of this dude he's not ranked in the ufc i don't believe um like in the official top 15 rankings but listen man big big win by chris curtis the action man i think he is here to stay aj um real quick on this next bout, AJ, because we don't have much to talk about. Jamal Hill, 48 seconds, got the KO over Jimmy Crew, 14 and 13, respectively, for these fighters. So it's interesting because uh, you don't really move up too much or down too much because you guys are pretty much neck and neck. So uh, listen, man, KO round one. What is there to say about this matchup, AJ? Ah, sh man, <laughs> power from Jamal Hill. I Absolutely. mean, dude, dude got it done in basically two punches. Crazy performance. Sad we doubted him. In, uh, dude, I, like, I'm literally, I was awestruck whenever I saw the fight going on. Not much to say because it was so fast, but Jamal Hill has that power. Jimmy Crute's a dog, but yeah. it was not the dog's day that day, man. <laughs> Jamal Hill was able to get it done. And Jamal, said, Jamal Hill said, why are you people doubting me? And I'm going to double down on why I was doubting. Listen, the dude was six months removed from an elbow dislocation in his power hand, but fortunately, the man didn't even need to throw his power hand. He didn't throw it not once. I believe there was four significant strikes in total. All of them were with his lead right hand, maybe a jab, a couple of check hooks, and that's all it took. And even that follow-up below that Jamal Hill gave to Jimmy Crew when he was on the ground was his right hand. So I'm still interested to see how powerful that left hand is. Is it the same? Is it a little bit different? Are you feeling comfortable with it? I'm interested in all that. I think it's very important. I think we're going to figure it out in his next bout. But this was a big win by Jamal Hill. My last question before we just move on, because this was, you know, another performance of the night bonus, but this was a quick, just a minute. How much did this fight tell you? It wasn't really a fight, man. It was just kind of a moment, you know? So what did you learn from this? Uh, I guess never count out Jamal Hill. Not really much to learn because we didn't really see a whole lot, but just count and count him out for that power. Really, that was the biggest thing for me, that power and precision. Can't really count out Jamal Hill ever, even when you do think that he's a little bit uh, co uh, compromised. Mm -hmm. Not maybe not that compromised. Yeah, yeah. I would. I just would have liked to see because we did see it, but Jimmy Crute was hurt when it happened. How good that Jamal Hill takedown defense is right now? Because he didn't. I mean, Jimmy Crute when he was hurt, he was wobbled and he tried to get Jamal Hill, and you could see there's a photo of it. He's fighting with everything in his might, like, ah, get off me, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, let me finish this fight. You know. So I just, I'm interested to see all that, man. That's still the question that I have for Jamal Hill. It's just some of that ground game stuff, man, that Paul Craig was able to expose a little bit. But a huge win for Sweet Dreams of Jamal Hill, man. We'll see where he goes in the matchmaking in just one moment. AJ, this is the biggest upset of the year and the reason why i say that is just because of how definitively bad this man was being kind of put on he was getting pieced up man at one point i believe it was about 46 unanswered strikes for leo santos to clay gita but then again this is very reminiscent to the uh anthony hernandez versus Adolfo vieta fight where the submission guy gassed himself out and the other guy you know which i guess in hernandez's case was another submission guy but basically Leo Santos gassed himself out, beating the brakes off of Clay Gita, and Clay Gita used toughness, intangibles, cardio, and unbreakable will to, in turn, 
break Leo Santos. He did what wrestlers do, what grinders do. He broke the soul of Leo Santos. He snatched it Goggin style. Um, and Gita, honestly, man, this was one of those things where he didn't win off of skill, man. He won off of heart and grit and determination. And he loved to see it, especially at a ripe age of about 39 years old. What did you make of this matchup overall? Ooh, never count Guida out, bro. Never. That was insane. Like, literally... This dude is a legend of legends, Leonardo Santos. It's rough when he gassed himself out and he really tapped to uh, exhaustion more than anything. I know that rear, that rear naked choke was deep, but you saw him instantly just go right for the tap, think about it, and then tap. Yeah, dude, Clay Guida is uh, insane, man. The fact that he was able to eat, what, like two, three knees to the face and then keep going, keep powering every time. Um, I forget what the the, the ref it was, but every time he'd say fight back, you'd see him throw one big haymaker and then um, uh, shelter back up, trying to you know, just survive a little bit. Very impressive for Clay Guida. It just showed the experience level, man. This dude is, he's done it so much. He's seen so many different things. Crazy that Santos had him on wobbly legs right at the beginning, landing some dirty, dirty shots, man. And uh, impressive, impressive, man. Yeah, to the displeasure of one dominant Cruz, Keith Peterson was the one refereeing. And uh, if you remember, Keith Peterson is the one that uh, kind of stopped the Cruz fight a little bit early when he fought. Who was it? It wasn't Casey Kenny. It was the fight before Casey Kenny. But either way, man, uh, Keith Peterson maybe learned his lesson and he pulled a Yamasaki a little bit, you know what I mean? And just letting Gita just get his fucking face smashed in. Gita said it himself. He was all like, listen, man, see, uh, Santos hit me square perfectly in the liver with that body kick, man. Dropped him with the body shot, hit him with the knee. It was nasty. But what's important is that Gita says he was able to hear his corner perfectly and his corner was telling him, keep your eyes on Santos. Move your head. Keep your hands up. And I think that's what kept him in the fight. That's why Peterson didn't stop the fight. Because it's not like, you know, when you shell up, and I can't do it because I need to stay on the mic, but when you shell up and you're looking down and all that good stuff and you're not looking at your opponent, you're not defending educated, um, yeah, you can stop the fight. But when you're staring and you're ducking and weaving and you're doing that defense that Charles Oliveira did when uh, Michael Chandler almost had him out and he's just kind of ducking and weaving on hands and knees doing that kind of tripod defense type stuff, man, it'll keep you in the fight. Intangibles, one clay gee to the fight. The Carpenter, man. This is, uh, let me see, for the Carpenter, first finish win since 2017 when he knocked out Joe Lazon in the first round. He moves to 17 and 15 in the UFC. And uh, the man got a performance of the night bonus, man. So he gets 50K on top of it. The man is going to be enjoying some new fishing equipment, I'm sure. Um, any last words on this bout, AJ? Man, just uh, what, what impresses me the most is that Guida at 39 is still able to get it done. This dude looks like he has a, he's a spry young chicken. Oh, bro. Yeah. It's insane. Going to be crazy to see where they get him up for the next fight. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. And if you were interested, folks, at plus 145, the under cashed in on this one. Not many people expected it, man, honestly. But either way, even if Santos would have got the finish, because some people do say that Keith Peterson, rightfully so, could have stopped the fight and nobody would have been mad about it, the under would have cashed. So listen, man, if you're a betting person, you care about overs and unders, man, definitely something to take into account. Um, AJ, before I pull up this next one, or I guess I'll pull this one up, but I want to pull this photo up with it. Um, respect, man. These dudes, I, I guess I didn't know because I didn't follow it as much going into this fight. Um, they had a, a relationship legitimately. Obviously, they had the Tiger Muay Thai connection. Both were like coaches. I think Riddell was a coach there first, and then Fazeev kind of took his job when Riddell left and whatnot. But the point is, is uh, Fazeev in the post-fight presser, he was like, man, I don't know how to feel. I'm happy and I'm sad. I'm happy because I won. I'm sad because you never want to win that way against a dude who you consider a friend. Either the way you had to fight they got the job done Fazeev was the better man he got a stunning uh wheel kick KO the 13th in UFC history but Brad Riddell fought a very very good fight and had this fight gone to points which was about two minutes away from doing so um I think Fazeev would have snuck out a very close decision I don't think it would have been lopsided but I could be wrong also what do you think of this AJ yeah, very back and forth. I mean, I, I had Fazeev just with a little bit of points just because of the pressure he was putting on. Yeah. But Brad Riddell looked thick, bro. Brad Riddell looked strong. Interesting to see that it took uh, Riddell that long to be able to get the takedowns. I believe mm -hmm. it was like four attempts, but only two takedowns. Impressive for Fazeev to be able to stand up that long. And it was only in the third, it might have been the second or the third, that Fazeev was able to defend those takedowns. And Riddell, he had the momentum going in the third, but right when that momentum started to pick up, he ate a heel to the chin. Sad way to see, especially because these dudes were friends and they're able to uh, go back to that camaraderie a little bit. But sometimes you just got to throw down. 
Yeah, sometimes you got to throw down, man. And uh, listen, at the end of the day, on this matchup specifically here, I think what's important is that um, Fazeev in that 100% takedown defense is something to be reckoned with, man. It's like Riddell tried, you know, and this is another one of those situations. What did I say in the pre-show? I said, uh, I think Riddell wins based on his kickboxing and a mixture of being able to get those takedowns. The takedowns are going to be key to the victory. He was not able to get the takedowns, thus he did not get the victory. He got knocked out instead. I didn't expect that necessarily. Um, but Fazeev also showcased that, man. He's not just hype, you know? And it's never like that was the expectation. He was just a hype trainer or anything like that. But to defeat a very well-rounded Brad Riddell, the man who could wrestle and kickbox with the best of them, was very, very impressive. Now, the kicks of Rafael Fazeev, man, who is going to figure out this puzzle? Because it seems like they're damn near on stage. Stoppable. Body kick, body kick. Oh, you're scared of the body kick? You want to turn the other way? All right, wheel kick. I was ready. He said he was setting it up the whole fight. He was waiting until the th third round to throw it. He threw it. Worked out beautifully, man. What do you think? Oh, shoot. The, the kicks and the striking of Fazeev are crisp, man. And what I liked about him, you could tell he's very tactical when he's going about it. He was setting up that, that heel kick for three rounds, and he knew exactly when to throw it to actually make it count. Very tactical, tactical for Fazeev going forward. Yeah, dude, this dude's uh, unstoppable. Also, what impressed me about him, too, is uh, the fact that when he was taken down by Riddell, he was able to pop back up right away. Oh, yeah. And even there was one point where Riddell, like, he had him basically uh, uh, Fazeev posted on all fours or, you know, both feet, both hands. And then Riddell's like, eh, let's just stand up. Interesting choice. I wonder what he felt to make him think that way yeah. instead of, you know, going for the takedown. But crazy, crazy fight, man. Either way. I felt the same way when he just disengaged. I was like, all right, man. So you just want to get back to the feet against this guy? Interesting game plan. But Fazeev was the better man. He's 5-1 and one in the UFC. Fifth win in a row. Second UFC finish, man. So he says he never looks for the finish. He never headhunts like that. It just comes when it comes. And it came this way, man. This is going to be on highlight reels for quite some time because he effectively froze Brad Riddell. He was knocked out stiff midair just like oh okay you know what i'm saying hey man listen ottoman big win minus 115 favorite he closed that got the big win and uh this one hit the under on two and a half rounds at plus 155 so you hit on that one aj it was close but uh you know not close enough right all right <laughs> let's move on to the main event brother the main event Jose Aldo, my man, he's sipping out of that fountain of youth that Manny Pacquiao was. It has to be the case. And the reason why I say that is because, uh, listen, Rob Font was sharp. Jab was working all night long, but it was not good enough because Jose Aldo's, or Jose Aldo, excuse me, his power was too much. What did you make of this matchup, AJ? Yeah, like you said, man, the power of Aldo was too much. The hands, too, man. The hands were looking good. The fact that uh, Aldo was able to drop Font a couple times. Very impressive. Spoke levels. And once Font got dropped in the first, it kind of looked like it was all downhill from there. Don't get me wrong, though. The the, the jab of Font was working very nicely. Had Aldo a little, little bruised up going into the fourth and fifth. But still, man, that Jose Aldo's a timeless wonder. Hell of a fight. Very back and forth. I had it scored the same way. I didn't, I didn't really see. Uh, I had a 49, 46, whatever that math is. Mm -hmm. But very impressive for Jose Aldo going forward. Man. One of my questions is to you is, did it? Is it me or did it seem like watching the fight that the striking was much closer than what the judges gave it? You know what I mean? Like to me, like it seems like a domination win for Jose Aldo. But when you're watching it, it was very hard fought. It was back and forth. It wasn't just one sided. I think some of those uh, rounds too, Jose Aldo only won the round because he snuck in a knockdown like at the end or at the beginning or that power was just the difference in that. Because Rob Font fought his ass off, man. Like, this was not a bad performance whatsoever. Do you agree with that? Is the, the on paper, like, if you didn't watch the fight and you just looked at it on paper, you probably would have thought it was a completely different fight, right? Yeah, I think the the on paper scoring has that that biases where we're not really looking at it just because Aldo was sneaking the rounds. He knew how yeah. to win the round at the end when it counted the most. And being so back and forth, the judges really didn't have an exact moment in which they were like, oh, yeah, this guy definitively won until Jose Aldo would sneak those those yeah. uh, those drops at the end or however he was getting it done. Very impressive. Uh, but honestly, man, Rob fought. If you look at how he was playing it, he fought his fight. He fought really yeah. good. It's just Jose Aldo knew those little bit of ways to get around it, man. And I mean, that's what being a two-time featherweight champion does for you. You know what I mean? One of the best in the game. And that's that's the key right there is those intangibles, that experience, man. It's second to none. And for Jose Aldo, man, um, he's basically said, okay, I've improved my boxing since fighting Piotr Jan. I've shown that I can do the top control thing like I did against Cheeto Vera. Against Rob Vaughn, he literally combined both of those aspects to win the fight. 
Were you surprised that Rob Font tried to engage in the grappling in the first round? Very. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I, I. I guess we don't really think of Jose Aldo as the grappling guy. I mean, he proved it in Marlon Mar- or the the Cheeto Vera fight where he's able to get it done. But we don't yeah. think of him as as you know that crazy grappler who's going to be going. But this dude's a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. Yeah. Like he always has that that in his pocket, no matter what. Interesting to see for Rob Font. Maybe he wanted to test it to prove that he has some chops on the ground as well. But that's a uh, levels to that game. Well, that's the thing about Jose Otto. He said he was like his dream was to become a soccer player, but he couldn't because he's from Rio de Janeiro and all they produce is just incredible BJJ players. So, you know what I'm saying? He was all like, yeah, man, this is what I had to do. I had to do jiu-jitsu. I'm from Brazil. What do you expect? You know, but um, I thought the, the jab of Rob Font, man, it was money all night long, but it seems like there was a very clear power difference. And this is what we talked about coming into this fight, that Jose Aldo is the big man coming from featherweight down. You know, he has the reach. He has the size. Rob Font isn't that big behemoth behemoth of a bantamweight that he normally is against some of these other fighters man so what's interesting to me is it's crazy to say that it's 2021 and jose aldo is very firmly clearly in the title picture at bantamweight right now you know what i mean he says he wants to fight tj dillashaw next we'll see where we go with that one but do you think right with this win right here aj jose aldo has solidified and confirmed that at bantamweight He's just as good, maybe if not a little bit better than, you know, his kind of waning years at Featherweight. Yeah, I think so, man. I, I think this is the fight that proved it for sure. Yeah. Either way, whichever one won, it was kind of that solidifier of the fight. But I think this one for Jose Aldo it really proves that he's the real deal going forward. That big man coming down, having that power. And that's what we were talking about in the pre-show is if how Rob Fontman handled the power and the size of Jose Aldo. Well, there was a very clear power mm-hmm. differential going forward. And I think it's the same for a lot of the other fighters, man. It's going to be a, a hard roll to toll going forth for the rest of the, uh, the 135-pound division. Now, final question on this matchup, AJ. Does Jose Aldo have the cardio to become a champion in this division? Because it seemed like that was definitely a big problem for him hitting rounds four and five. What do you think? Well, yeah, it, it's, it definitely seems that way. And he's always kind of, even in the uh, the Piotr Jan fight, you know, the, the, you get into those fourth and fifth rounds, you really start to wane and drop down. Um it's going to be interesting to see because that, that seems like that's his one glaring hole in his game plan is that gas tank. Bold prediction, AJ. Does Jose Aldo in the year 2022 become a bantamweight champion? Very bold prediction. Yeah, I'm going to say yes, oh. man. I, I think he can get it done. I think it's it's if – if um, what's it called? If um, – not Piotr Jan, Aljo Sterling is mm-hmm. able to get it done, I think Jose can beat him. Okay. Now, will he be able to beat Piotr Jan? Eh. Uh, I don't know. That's a hard one. I mean, didn't do it the first time. I don't know if he'd be able to do it the second. Then again, it was his first fight at bantamweight, so eh, I don't know. All right. Well, that's the main card, man. This was a fun slate of fights, a lot of upsets on the card overall, man. I, I could not be happier about just a sleeper card like this, man, because this wasn't the most hyped up thing. And then for this last bout right here, um, Rob Font and Aldo hit the over at minus 145, man. One decision. So you know what time it is right there. Um, AJ, man, before we move on to the matchmaking and all that, we got to hit one portion. Very condensed because we didn't do it earlier. I forgot. Sorry about it. Fighter of the night. Give me a very condensed version of your fighter of the night, AJ. Just maybe a couple of words on it who is it why what stood out all that good stuff bro my fighter of the night is one of the ones that we doubted the most maybe not the most but one of the ones we doubted pretty heftily right here and i'm going jamal hill he might have only been able to not really throw his left hand like you said there was a little bit of that atrophy going forward wasn't as big as the other side but he proved that he's still very dangerous with the one hand man no never count him out crazy to see that he's able to just jump back that quick and he Didn't even need two hands, man. Able to get it done with just one. Very impressive for Jamal Hill. I doubt hit him very highly. I I didn't even think he had a chance in this fight going forward. But that power is real deal. And able to drop an absolute dog in Jimmy Crew twice. Very impressive win. My fighter of the night is Jamal Hill. Just for the fact that we doubt, especially me, I doubted him so much that I didn't see this coming at all. I thought it was a gimme for for the most part uh very impressive win for jamal hill he's my fighter of the night for being able to get it done one-handed going forward what about you derek who's yours 
All right, man. And we're both basically going on the dudes we had to eat crow on, man. I'm going Chris Curtis as my fighter of the night. The action, man. What is? What else is there to say? I said it all earlier in the show, but just for this clip right here for this segment, the action, man, has proven everybody wrong. Listen, stand-up is some of the best of them. Psy psychologically, being cool, calm, and collected in some of the biggest moments, he's able to make it happen. I don't know what else there is to say, man. You got to buy in right now on the action, man. He's very experienced. Don't call him a journey, man. Call him the action, man, because he brings the punch, man. Whether it is a body shot that's going to beat you up right there or bring it up over the top, hit you with a knee, drop an elbow. It does not matter. He's talking in the cage. He's got Strickland in his corner. Great camp. I don't know, man. The action, man, is my fighter of the night for UFC Vegas 44. Simple, plain. There you go. Right there. What else we need to say? All right, AJ. This is some matchmaking, my man. So we can run through these ones pretty quickly. I think it shouldn't be uh, too difficult to match people up over here, man. And I want to start off with Jose Aldo. TJ Dillashaw is the obvious play. I have a contrarian play, AJ. Do you have anything contrarian, or do you have that TJ Dillashaw pick? Yeah, I had Dillashaw on there as well, but I kind of want to see Aldo versus Sanhagen, man. I want to see the Sandman get back there. I think that's a good fight for him. I mean, the, the two you know veterans of the game Aldo Dillashaw going at it it makes for great headlines but I think Sandhagen would be a more interesting fight to be honest I agree with you now some people are saying that it should be Sandhagen versus Font and then Dillashaw versus Aldo but I say go contrarian because uh DJ Dillashaw he's still injured man it's still going to take some time so for that quick turnaround for Jose Aldo I say you give it to Corey Sandhagen yes he's lost two back to back on paper at least right but Dillashaw is going to be out with that injury so let's keep the division moving it's been held up long enough with Aldo sterling um you know what i mean having the constant injuries and all that good stuff you know what i mean but i just think that Corey sandhagen is going to be a difficult test for jose aldo still man really whoever man like you saw how close he came to beating piotr Jan. you saw how close he came or did you know defeat tj dillashaw listen man i just think it's going to be a fun matchup i think that these dudes are going to be in this kind of lock this 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 gridlock at the top those top three four names I don't think there's anybody that can beat him in the division right now. So we'll leave it at that one. Um, Rafael Fazeev, man. Who do you have on this one? Because I got a tough, tough test for him. I want to see him tested. What do you think, brother? Yeah, I got a tough, tough test as well, man. I want to see Fazeev versus Gregor Gillespie. Yes, I think sir. that's the way to go. That's the that's the wrestling we need to see. We need to see somebody who's going to keep going for it entirely and put Fazeev in positions that he's not the most comfortable in. I think that's the way to go. There's a lot of, there's a lot of dogs in that fight going forward. But when you're at the rank that Fazeev is – it's all, all killed it from here on out. That's the one. We already know he could strike with the best of them. The question is, how will he fare against an elite, non-stop grappler in Gregor Gillespie? Man, one of the best wrestlers in the division. I don't know. I'd like to see. I think that's an easy one. That's a layup. But still, it needs to be matched up. Let's make it happen. All right, the Carpenter, man. Where do you go with him? Um, because at this point, he called out. He said he wanted to fight Chris Grusmacher, but since he lost, he was all like, well, I'll fight the winner of that fight, which would then be Claudio Pueyes. But I think that he needs to fight... You know, I don't know, maybe someone different. I don't know. It's just tough with him because it's like, listen, it's not like he's going to be fighting for a title here soon, man. He said he called out Nate Diaz. He was like, I'll give you a rematch, bro, what you want to do. It's like at this point, he's just fighting just to fight, and that's kind of the beauty of it. He's doing it for fun, I think, at this point of his career. Who do you have next for the Carpenter? Yeah, I think that's what's fun about Clay Guida is he's just fighting to fight. Yeah. It doesn't really, he's, you know, there's no title aspirations. There might be, but I, I don't see it coming forward. I want him to fight another pretty well-known OG in the name, man. I'm going A-10 Jim Miller. Okay. I think that'd be an interesting one. You know, two scrappers going at it. It'd be a lot of fun to see. What about you, Derek? Who you got? Well, I don't know if they fought before, but it feels like Jim Miller and uh, and uh, Guida, maybe. They, it sounds like they should have fought before, right, in their long-ass careers, man. I got a young gun because you know my motto, man. If you an OG sticking around, you got to fight the young guns. You got to keep your spot. You got to earn your keep. I think he needs to fight number 25 ranked Grant Dawson, man. Um, Guida's a force that just won't stop, man. And uh, Dawson's coming off a no contest to Ricky Glenn, and he just narrowly defeated Leo Santos earlier this year. Let's see if he can get past Carpenter because – if we're being honest, Guida had a better win over Santos than Dawson did. So let's see if you could one-up the man that got a better win than you on the same opponent. You know what I mean? Do you like that matchup? A wrestler versus wrestler? I, oh, yeah. I always like the the old guy versus mm -hmm. young guy matchups going forward. It's just uh, who, who does the UFC want to see gum up? Is, does, is uh, Grant Dawson right there ready to be propelled into the next yeah. level? We'll see. I like that fight as well, though. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. Jamal Hill. 
Um, he calls out Johnny Walker, but honestly, AJ, there's only two fights that make sense for him right now, basically, because most people are booked up and he's got a loss to Paul Craig, so you can't really advance too far. Johnny Walker or Ryan Spann. Did you have either of those two dudes in there? Yeah. I had both both yeah. of them. <laughs> those are the those are the ones, man. That's the fights that need to happen, especially with the long, lanky, and the power that we need to see how Jamal Hill handles himself. I think either of those fights are really, really nice. A stand-up war with Johnny Walker and Jamal Hill would be very fun to watch. That'd be popcorn under one and a half rounds, guaranteed. You know what I'm saying? So let's book that one up. And then lastly, AJ, Chris Curtis, the action man. We talked too much about the man already in this episode, but he got the big bump over Brandon Allen. Um, Listen, man, where are you going with this one? You can go anywhere with Chris Curtis right now. Some people are even talking about being ranked. I don't know about that quite yet, but, uh, you know, where are you going with this one? Yeah, this one is a little a little harder just because of so many options in which to see. I think that Chris Curtis does need another name though, another big name going forward. And I I, I was either, I'm I'm torn between two, man. I'm gonna give them both just because I feel like they're both kind of in the same realm. Maybe not the same type of fighter, but in the same realm of where he can go. I'm going either Edmund Shabazian or Christoph Jotko. Mm-hmm. Right around that level, right around where he's going. Jotko, I'm leaning a little bit more towards. But either way, I think it'd be a good fight for Chris Curtis to kind of get his name yeah. recognition up there. Listen, man, I don't know if it's just layups or if we just on the same page here today because I had Christoph Jocko, only one name. And I just said the reason why is because these two striking back and forth for 15 minutes would be nothing short of beautiful violence right there, man. Both very technical, stand-up war, not going to hit the mat. I'd, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that strictly in just in a boxing match, honestly, man, because these dudes do a lot of work with just the hands right there. So I think that'd be a fun matchup. And we know Christoph Jocko is a test. He is a very tough test to pass. And if Chris Curtis can do that, then we're really talking, you know what I'm saying? But in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the meantime, listen, I think that that's your matchmaking right there, folks. You know what I'm saying, AJ? So, brother, let's just hit this last piece of business and let's get out of here, my man. Um, I have one question for you. We had very short news while you're here. What's next for the women's 145-pound division now that Felicia Spencer has called it a career? She got the big win over Leah Ledson. That was a layup right there. We talked about it. We said, what does this win even do for you, X, Y, and Z? I think it, what it did is give her the peace of mind to say, I can call it a career. I know what I've done in the sport. I know what I'm capable of. I went five rounds with two of the best female women's mixed martial arts practitioners on the planet in Chris Cyborg and Amanda Nunez. Listen, what else is there to say? But what is, what's next for this division, man? We already pronounced it dead, if, if you remember, man, many, many moons ago. We said, oh, yeah, this is the last fight. It's dead. Somehow, someway, it, it, it's back. And uh, it, I think it's going to be dead here soon again if Kayla Harrison doesn't sign. So what do you think? Yeah, if, if they don't have a big sign coming up, man, this is basically dead in the water. I mean, you have people retiring, people not wanting to fight. There's no depth to the division. You have basically five fighters you can pull from. They've all already fought each other. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a hard road for the 145-pound women division going forward, man. Yeah, absolutely. But the question, I guess the larger question that looms given this circumstance is, do you envision Amanda Nunez fighting Juliana Pena, which could be, I think it's either this next week, the next week's card, or, you know, sometime this month. Um, do you envision if she wins in a dominant fashion, calling it quits, and then the 145-pound division is clearly, definitively, officially retired? What do you think? Well, if she does, and if she does call it quits, yeah, there's there's no one else. They're not going <laughs> to just pull the yeah. random, you know, a, a four-person division going forward. They'll cut that for sure. I don't, I don't know if the go to retire, man. I think she's going to stay on top. That would be interesting to see. But if she does, yeah, the 45 is just done, basically. The question is, what else is there to prove? If, if you're Amanda Nunez, you beat everybody. You've de- destroyed and dominated everybody. You know, you knocked out Chris Cyborg. You knocked out Ronda Rousey. I mean, Juliana, Juliana Pena, let's be honest. Do you think that that's a legitimate – and, like, no disrespect, we're going to talk about it in a second. But do you think that um, that's, like, a real hallmark win in her career? I, I think that uh, one of the stepping stones that kind of gets lost in the cobble work, if you know yeah. what I mean, like not necessarily one of the ones that you shine up and you're looking at like, damn, I beat her. It's one of those ones that's like, yeah, she's another name to the list. 
which is a, a sad thing to say for Pena, but I mean, just the goal Amanda Nunez is, is, is that dominant, you know? Listen, man, we're talking about like, and it's no disrespect towards Juliana Pena because you could say the same thing with like some random dude, not random, but one of the lesser names, lesser known names that like Anderson Silva has beaten or that John Jones has beaten or these type of people. That's the caliber of fighter we're talking about here. So it's no disrespect. I mean, to go, you know, and compete with these legends is an honor in and of itself. But uh, yeah, I think that it's going to be uh, RIP for this division. Once again, you know, here in the very, very near future so that is the newswire today aj we got a hell of a card next week and yes it is nunez pena Oliveira versus poirier for the lightweight title nunez pena for the bantam women's bantamweight title and then uh i guess this is an outdated poster because uh masvidal is definitely not fighting leon edwards so another bout is replacing that one but forgive for the moment folks should be fun keep your eyes out we got some work to do aj both of us we need to go back to the drawing board reassess and uh you know work on our film study a little bit because maybe there's something that we didn't see this this week right here but at the end of the day we're both over 500 right here man we're both in it to win it all the good stuff man there's only a couple more events here for the end of the year folks so keep it locked in stay tuned man drop a like subscribe all the good stuff you already know what time it is this is the bloody water podcast and folks i just want to take a very quick moment right here to say um, if you didn't notice, this is the 100th episode. Thank you guys for rocking with us for 100 episodes. This is the centennial episode right here, man. This is an episode that is important to me because uh, in no podcast endeavor that I've ever, you know, done i've reached 100 episodes man that is a lot especially for what we do on this program aj man so what does the number 100 mean to you my man is it special what does this benchmark mean to you in terms of the progression of this platform and your own creative endeavors in and of itself brother man i've uh over my short 30 years derek i've done so many different performance aspect things you know from theater to comedy to this to just so many different things that i've tried in my life and the fact that we've able to been hitting 100 and having folks rocking with us since day one and still rocking and growing bro this is just milestones i gotta yeah. thank everybody bro. thank you too for reaching out and getting this thing going of course. And especially thanks to the fans out there for subscribing and keeping us rocking man this is a humbling experience man 100 yeah. 100 episodes down That's a right. shitload of film study in the book as well That's yeah right. bro this is uh it's a cool thing to see and like i you know working going for all this you know just doing all the film study didn't even really put two and two together didn't think about it but now that able to a little bit of uh reconsideration or refocus on it man it's very it's, it's humbling it's a cool thing i'm excited for the next hundred gonna keep pushing right. keeping the followers growing we thank y'all for rocking with us especially if you're all the way out in indonesia that's what's up bro hell yeah holler at us in the comments <laughs> let us know where you're from we appreciate all the love out there that's See you right in the next man. That's right. See you in the next hundred, folks. And I will just say you can I think you guys can see what our mindset is. We're very uh, head down. You know what I'm saying? Just grinding at it because when 100 episodes pass by, even though I've been kind of foreshadowing it for a while, when the moment comes, you're like, oh, OK, 100. All right, cool. Well, when's 200? You know what I'm saying? Like, let's just keep it pushing. It's one goal after the uh, after another one foot in front of the other. Listen, you can only do it one day at a time, one episode at a time. And that's how we're rocking right here. Thank you for rocking with us, folks. We kept you long enough. We're going to do it again. Mondays and Fridays, 8 a.m. Hit us up on Bloody uh, on Twitter at Bloody Water Pod or on Instagram at Bloody Water Podcast, BloodyWaterPodcast.com overall. Um, and listen, folks, I'll just say this, man. Uh, if you don't like the long segments, you know where to find the short clips right in the playlist. Hit our YouTube channel. Free Thinkers Club is the channel name. Bloody Water Podcast is the program. My name is Derek G. I am your host. And closing out, AJ, my co-host, the New Mexico native, Santa Fe Bomber. We'll do it again, brother. Until next time, folks. Peace.